Hey guys, long time no see. I'm sharing this video on the Lessons from the Screenplay channel because I think it's a great new resource for all you writers out there. John Truby, whose book The Anatomy of Story I have talked about many times on this channel, has a new book out called The Anatomy of Genres, and it's great. We recently had John Truby on our podcast to discuss the book, chat about some movies, and break down why people don't talk enough about genre, if they talk about it at all. We had a really fascinating conversation, and I think you're going to find it very useful. Now, I know many of you have been asking when a new video essay is going to be released, and my honest answer is, I don't know. As I mentioned on Twitter earlier this year, I'm currently working with Bioware on the next installment of Mass Effect. It's a dream come true gig, and all of my time and energy is currently focused on that, as well as a few other side projects. For now, I hope you really enjoy this special episode of Beyond the Screenplay, a conversation with John Truby. Hi, I'm Michael, and welcome to Beyond the Screenplay, the podcast where each episode we do a conversational deep dive analysis into a film. Today, we're doing something different. So I'm here with part of the Beyond the Screenplay team, Trisha Rand. Hello, everyone. And we are joined by a very special guest. So anyone who is familiar with the Lessons from the Screenplay YouTube channel has surely heard me say probably more times than they care. In his book, The Anatomy of Story, John Truby writes, uh, because it's one of, if not the most referenced book in the videos on Lessons from the Screenplay, he has a new book out called The Anatomy of Genres, How Story Forms Explain the Way the World Works, and he is here to chat with us about it. John Truby, welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me. I, I can, couldn't be more excited to be here with you with the, in this fantastic podcast and uh, talking about my favorite subject. <laughs> I'm, yes, I'm, so I'm also really excited. So uh, just as a little bit of history, so your, your previous book, The Anatomy of Story, was kind of the first screenplay book that clicked for me. And it's not overstating things to say that I don't think Lessons from the Screenplay would be what it became without that book because it was the first time you know I think you have this really great ability to take things that I feel like implicitly I kind of had a fuzzy idea of because I'd seen so many movies and I know you know there's something at work here but I can't quite put my finger on it uh, and you're able to sharpen those ideas and focus them so that then you can like grab a hold of them and use them as a tool and so I really, really loved Anatomy of Story. It opened my eyes to so many things. And Anatomy of Genres is awesome and going to do the same thing. And you're getting into more detail. And I'm really excited about all of it. So uh, kind of just to start, I'm curious, like, why, what made you want to write the Anatomy of Genres? And how do you feel like it's a continuation or a partner? Or what's its relationship to the Anatomy of Story? Well, it, it's Michael. It's also it, it's a, actually a very interesting evolution on how it came about. It, it was the product of about fifty years of work, and the wow. last five years of writing. So it's been quite the uh, quite the project. I wasn't quite sure I could finish a marathon <laughs> that went on for that long, but <laughs> luckily I did. Um, but to give you some background about how this book came about, you know, a lot of times when I talk to writers about what I do, they say, "Oh." Yeah, I, I know all about story. Um, they say, oh, I, I use three-act structure, or I use the hero's journey, or I use save the cat. And they think, well, that's all I need. And here's the problem, and I really don't like having to tell them this, but th these books are fine for beginners, but they have very few practical story techniques, and certainly mm. almost nothing that can tell you how to write at the professional level. And I always have to, to tell writers, remember, we're not just talking about, wouldn't it be nice to write a script? No, we're talking about being in the top 1% of writers, selling your material, and ideally creating your own brand. And so when I wrote The Anatomy of Story, my goal was to include all the professional story techniques a writer would need in order to write a best-selling novel or a screenplay that actually sells. But the one subject it doesn't cover, which is now the key to writing a hit film or novel, is how to write the different genres that make up 99% of popular storytelling today. 
And what I believe is that writers who want to succeed professionally have to write the stories that the business, and by that I mean the studios, the publishers, and of course the readers, want to buy. And that means that the storytelling game is won by mastering the structure of genres. And that means, first of all, mastering the 15 to 20 story beats that are unique to each form. So that was the original motivation for writing the anatomy of genres. And in fact, the first half of each chapter goes through these plot beats, these 15 to 20 unique plot beats in great detail to show you how to write them, as well as the order that they are most dramatic in terms of, of expressing whatever this story problem is to the, to the reader and the audience. Um, and these are the beats that have to be in the story. And then, as we'll, I'm sure, get into, the second half of each chapter is a whole lot more. It's a whole lot bigger. And it's an area, it's an area of theme that is probably the most misunderstood aspect of all writing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm so glad that you bring up theme because I was loving listeners of our show know that I'm obsessed with theme. Um, but I was just loving that the genres, you know, I have long, um, advocated for people to understand genre, uh, as critical in understanding theme because certain kinds of themes are innately explored in certain genres or to put it another way, certain themes are embedded in yep. the very nature of certain genres. And, you know, in, in my sort of, I guess, haphazard way, I've ha always had a vague idea of what those are, right? Like <laughs> Westerns are about civilization. I kind of understand this and yeah. like justice and these kinds of things. And obviously, you know, crime is dealing with morality and justice and, um, these kinds of vague notions in my mind about, well, this theme makes sense uh, because the genre inherently deals with it. But I love that the book is organized, mm. completely organized, according to what themes each genre sort of addresses. Yeah. Can, so can you speak a little bit to that? I'm, I'm so glad you, you picked up on that because that to me was the most exciting part of writing this book mm -hmm. and the most revelatory part for me of writing this book. In the opening chapter, I talk about the three unwritten rules by which the entire entertainment business is based, and that means film, novels, television. And the, the first of them is it's a genre world. You have to master yeah. the particular genre you're writing. And you have to know it and, and execute it better than anybody else. The, the second major rule is that you succeed by mixing genres. The, in other words, we don't have in any of these mediums single genre stories anymore. It's typically a combination of two, three, even four forms, which allows you to express a great deal of plot, much more plot than a single genre story allows you to do. But the real trick, the real key to setting yourself apart and really nailing the genre that you work in is, is the third rule, which is that in order to be successful and set yourself apart from everyone else writing that particular genre story, you have to transcend the form. And that means, first mm. of all, you have to twist the beats. There's three ways you do it. You twist the beats or you execute the beats in a way that we've never seen before. But the second one is that each genre expresses a deeper life philosophy through, this, through the theme. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to be successful, you have to know what that life philosophy is, and you have to then express it through your story. Now, immediately, writers run into problem with theme because they've, they've heard the old Samuel Goldwyn line of, you know, if you want to send a message, send it uh, Western <laughs> Union, right? Mm -hmm. so yeah. They don't want to be on the nose. They don't want to hit you over the head with it and preach to the audience. And they're absolutely right about that. They don't want to do that. But what they do is they go to the other extreme. They completely devoid the script of theme. That's the biggest mistake you can make because what these, what these viewers are coming back to the same genre every time for is not because of the plot beats. 
they know the plot beats. They, they've seen it thousands <laughs> yeah. of times. You know, yes, they want to see it done in a different way. They want you to surprise their expectations. But what they're really coming back for is they love the theme of that story. They love the life philosophy of that form. And so you need to be able to express that through the story. And the beauty of genres is they're not just a plot system. They're a theme system. The theme has already yeah. been worked out. And so, and it's been worked out through the plot beats. So all you have to do is hit those plot beats, but then also be conscious of what that unique theme for that genre really is. Then you can pull it out. And, you know, right in the big beginning of the book, um, I, I give some examples of what we're talking about because the theme that these each of these genres has is typically quite different than you might think. So, for example, memoir is not about the past. It's about creating your future. Fantasy is about finding the magic in the world and in ourselves in order to turn life into art, to make your own life a work of art. Detective fiction shows us how to think successfully by comparing different stories to learn what is true. And love stories, which I consider to be the highest genre, love stories reveal that happiness comes from mastering the moral act, the moral act of loving another person. And so this is what the second half of each chapter is about, is being very detailed in terms of what each life philosophy is and showing you how to express that in your story in a way that allows you tra to transcend the form and do something that's a unique work of art that only you could write. And then you're on, your ro you're on your, the road to having your own story brand because what you've got there is something that no one else can write, which means that the business has to come to you, <laughs> right? Instead of the thousands of other people who are writing in the same form. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, so I was delighted to see that second half of each chapter. Cause I think that's, uh, you know, kind of even what you were just saying, there's a great example of that taking a, a fuzzy idea that I had in my head and then mm -hmm. sharpening it so that I, I suddenly realized what it was where like your, your um, chapter on detective stories and thriller stories uh, as an examination of like, you know, how the mind works and, you know, the, the thematic ideas that are being um, explored in those genres. Basically, as soon as I read those words, I was like, oh, that's why I love detective stories. Like, <laughs> I'm like that's exactly what I like to see explored in, in my films. And, yep. and the yep. distinction mm -hmm. between detective and thriller as like, oh, like I've always used those words. And I think sometimes people think of genres aesthetically, maybe, or like have these kind mm. of different associations to it. Yep. But the meaning behind it, as you're saying, the theme behind it. Once that, you know, is explained clearly, it's like this epiphany for me as a movie lover of like, oh, right, this is why I love these stories. And this yeah. is why even if the execution is maybe not per like as long as they're nailing this uh, meaning behind all of it, why I'm drawn into certain sure. genres over others. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so I, just, I really appreciated that. And, and I'm curious, like. Do you have a, a favorite genre? Like as you were going through all of these genres, was there like a chapter you enjoyed working on more than well, another? It, another excellent question. I love this question. <laughs> um, and uh, it took me a while to think of this because it, it, these genres are, especially after writing this book, they're, they're kind of like your children. You know, mm -hmm. you, they're, they're all different. You love them all. But I have to say there are some faves. And, <laughs> and for me, the... Probably of all of them, my, fa my favorite is the anti-Western, um, mm. although they aren't really written much anymore. But it's mm. interesting, and I think this is the reason why I was so affected by that form, is that in a three-year period from 1968 to 71, we had four great anti-Westerns, Butch Cassidy, Wild Bunch, Once Upon a Time in the West, and McCabe and Mrs. Miller. And mm -hmm. I believe no other genre has had that spurt of creative brilliance in a three-year period. Mm -hmm. And it just, those, those four films changed my life. And I, I, and I think, the, I love the larger form because the Western is about 
the rise of the American dream, and the anti-Western is about its inevitable fall. So the Western is really about the rise and fall of civilization. And, and the, the, the chapter headings, as you, as you probably noticed, um, list what, what is the larger story that each of these genres is exploring. And I love, and, and that's why the, the Western is kind of this uber form that encapsulates everything, you know. And along with gangster, the anti-Western is the closest genre to the great American novel, which is about how we have failed to meet the promise of our founding documents like the Declaration of Independence. So it would probably be the Western and the gangster story, which, which directly comes off of the Western. And, and that's another reason why I love those two is because they are a direct line. Western to gangster is a direct line and it encapsulates all of American history. Well, if we can then dive in a little bit into uh, at least the gangster uh, section that you wrote. Um, so I love The Great Gatsby uh, and Mad Men is one of my favorite TV shows. And I was very surprised to find both of those titles in the gangster <laughs> section. Yes. <laughs> uh, can you explain a little bit more about what kind of what you were just saying, um, the American dream and kind of the themes that are brought out by stories like Gatsby and Mad yeah, Men sure. um, that we might not think of as being gangster? Well, again, you've, you've, you've picked out one of my favorite things about the gangster chapter and one of the reasons that the gangster chapter is one of my favorite chapters. Um, and it, 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 I didn't come to that right away in terms of Great Gatsby and Mad Men being in that form until I realized what is the gangster really about at the transcendent level? Mm. And if we go through, you know, Gatsby and Mad Men, I, it becomes very clear. And it, 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 you realize it, they have to be there because the Great Ga Gatsby is the first gangster story. Gatsby is a gangster. It came out in 1925. And in fact, one scene from Gatsby was copied directly by one of the three gangster films that originally set the form, that film being Scarface. And these, these happened in around 1931. Now, more importantly, Great Gatsby and Mad Men transcend the form, and they're what I call economic political epics. And the gangster story and the economic political epic are about the corruption of the American dream, and in a larger sense, the corruption of capitalism and the republic. So transcendent gangster stories say that capitalism is inherently corrupt, and that it's, it's inevitable that money will buy and destroy the republic. And when you break down Mad Men, which in my opinion is the greatest television show ever made. Um, and I agree. I, and I, I don't broach <laughs> any argument on that. <laughs> but I, So I'm glad to hear you say that. But in many ways, Mad Men is our modern great Gatsby. Mm -hmm. Both have a main character who has reinvented himself based on a lie. And they're both about the basic creed of America that says you can be anyone you want to be. So I consider Great Gatsby to be the great American novel, and I consider Mad Men as the great American novel on television. And I consider both to be among the greatest works of American storytelling. Yeah. Very hard agree. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah, there's a really great breakdown of that a little bit more in the chapter, too. Yeah. And I feel like that's, a, you know, again, a great example of, like you're saying, Trisha, first reaction is surprised to find it there. But once you kind of sink into how you're thinking about genre and classifying mm -hmm. them, like you're saying, it, it clicks and makes total sense. And I, I, I found it even um, helping me reframe uh, my approach to certain genres that maybe aren't my favorite, which I'm, mm. I'm ashamed to say, like Westerns, I have trouble with. <laughs> but the way, uh, you know, you frame them what and, and uh, talking about what what these things are really about made me want to go and watch a bunch through yeah. that lens and finally yeah. understand. Um, 
And so uh, another fun chapter uh, is on crime, and I love crime stories. And uh, the Lessons from a Screenplay video on The Dark Knight uh, was a mm. video in which I used several quotes uh, from you. I feel like it's the biggest uh, video on the channel. And so thank you for uh, letting sure. me steal things <laughs> from your book and opponents and uh, yeah, the, a lot of great lessons in that video. Um, but so you, you spend some time in the crime section about uh, the Dark Knight as an example of you know a transcendent crime story and yeah. the Joker's relationship. Um, I wonder if you could just talk about that a little bit and why that that film is such a great example of a crime film. Well, like you, I am a huge fan of The Dark Knight. I consider it to be the greatest superhero movie ever made and a lot better than that. I mean, that that <laughs> limits it in terms of its greatness. Um, but, you know, the, the uh, Dark Knight is really a crime fantasy epic. So you're combining some things right there, which means mm. when, anytime you add epic to a, to a form, you're basically doing a, a story of a nation. And so the, the Dark Knight is really a crime story about America. And there's a number of reasons why I consider it such a great film and so su such a great expression of this, of a transcendent crime story. The first being that it has... Its, its hero has the greatest weakness, need, and ghost of any superhero character, and far superior to a character like Superman. Mm -hmm. um, and so what you can do with this character is so much greater than you can do with any other superhero character. Um, second of all, the entire plot of The Dark Knight is designed to be a series of moral conundrums that the Joker creates to expose what he believes is the true animal nature of humankind. And so I, I talk in the book about, you know, Batman is the dark knight, um, but the, the Joker is the dark philosopher. And it, it's really, you know, it, it, I think when the movie first came out, it was just, it, it was sometimes interpreted that he's just out to destroy things, which he's certainly up for doing that. But I, but his justification for it, which he does in that great scene when Batman is interrogating him in the in the police station, is where he gives this kind of existential justification for what he does, where he says, you know, beneath the the thin veneer of civilization that these that all these other people have, they're just animals, and at the first sign of danger, that veneer is going to disappear. Um, and so the, I, I think the, the third reason it's so great is that transcendent crime highlights the difference between what is legal and what is moral. And the Dark Knight constantly asks, how far will you go to save the city from an immoral and ruthless man who's determined to reduce everyone to an animal? And so that, and, and in that chapter on crime, I get into in great depth the whole concept of the moral code, which is mm -hmm. crucial to all stories, but it is all, it's what the crime form is all about. It, it, this deeper story that it is expressing is the story of morality itself. That's how massive it is. And, and so the, the, uh, I think a fourth reason that it's so powerful, this film, again, has to do with theme. I think more than any other superhero movie, The Dark Knight questions the value of the savior itself. And keep in mind, all superhero movies are savior movies. And what The Dark Knight says is that relying on the savior is actually destructive to society. And that's why Batman has to take the fall at the end. That, that is that's hmm. barely scratching the surface of how great this film is and how much I respect it. Yeah, I love your point there. I was feeling very vindicated by your point about the Joker and uh. his series of moral conundrums um, because I think that, you know, this... The Joker is an attractive character and has been adapted, obviously, many times now across many different movies. Um, I think the way that he's designed in The Dark Knight is incredibly brilliant. And it's for exactly the reason that you just mentioned there, um, which is that uh, even though he claims to be, you know, an agent of chaos, 
he actually is very carefully designed these yes. moral conundrums, or rather the screenwriter obviously yes. <laughs> has very carefully designed right. <laughs> these moral conundrums that drive at the theme, right? Yeah. And push push the Batman character um, to confront the exact theme that you're addressing there, the, yeah. the line between what is legal and what is moral. Um, you know, will you do something immoral? Um, will you do something illegal to catch the bad guy? Yes. Uh, will you do something immoral to catch the bad guy is like the greater sort of question. Right. Um, and I think that that's so instructive to realize about the character. I think screenwriters love to, um, you know, express like this chaotic philosophy uh, by like undesigning their story or something <laughs> instead of meticulously designing right. it in the way that it is in The Dark Knight. Right. Well, I, I mean, to me, The, the Dark Knight is not only a, a fabulous example of a transcendent crime story, it's just a, it's a screenwriting lesson on every level. Study it carefully if you want to write great stories in the screenplay form, because especially in the area of the question is that's central to any story, you give the hero a goal, but then what you track over the course of it is what are the costs that you right. are going to pay to get that goal. And what you, a really good story, a really good screenwriter will put the, the, main character under increasing pressure to to say, okay, is it still worth it? Are you going to go this far? Are you going to go even farther? Is it still worth it? Because, because immorality, immoral action is its own form of slavery. And this is one of the deep lessons of storytelling and especially that we see in screenwriting. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. The film is, is yeah, just amazing that it's operating on all these levels and it's also just super fun to watch. Like yeah. it's just it's one of those like <laughs> perfect films. But I think like you're saying, it's it's also a great one to study because I think those lessons are detectable and accessible if you yep. just kind of can zoom in a little bit and focus more. You know, I think that's why why the video that I made was so successful. And you know, your um, point in the anatomy of story about make sure your hero and opponent are competing for the same goal. Mm. Like that's very much on the page with the dark knight the joker has lines that he says out loud that point yeah. to that and so yeah that's a really really great um uh movie to study and so i'm so i'm thinking also about you know you you have these 14 genres that you talk about in this book and there's kind of like a, a ladder that you build mm. and kind of ranking from kind of lowest to highest in a way and the foundation, if I'm not mistaken, is is horror is the first one that you go into. So I'm curious to yeah hear you talk about what's kind of the philosophy behind that, the ladder of it, and why horror is the first stop on that journey. Well, it, it, it's it's horror is such an interesting genre to look at because it's so looked down on, and and that is so wrong. Um, it, again, what it's really about is so different from what the average viewer thinks it's about. But horror appears to be a story about scaring the audience. In fact, it's about how we confront death and how we deal with the sins of our life that have never been paid for. And so the life philosophy of horror is expressed in the form's greatest, greatest technique. Single greatest technique comes from the original great horror film, uh, I mean, horror story Frankenstein, which is still the greatest. Frankenstein is one of the most important stories in the history of story. And the great technique that it uses is that over the course of the story, the monster becomes the hero. In other words, we switch hero and opponent. We flip them. And what, what happens is when the monster becomes the hero, this character that we thought was so horrifying at first, we find out, no, that's the most humane character in the story. And the characters we thought were the heroes become animals attacking anything that doesn't look like them. And so ultimately, the best horror comes from seeing the inhuman, the monster, in ourselves. It's the fear of what doesn't look like us, the fear of the other. And I think one of the We've seen one of the greatest horror stories in the history of the form just in the last few years with Get Out, which to me is, again, if, if I were going to say, besides Frankenstein, what is the one horror story that that I just 
you know, praise to the heavens, <laughs> it would be get out. It's that You're great. speaking our language, yeah. John. Yeah. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Good. Um, but if you break it down, it's, it, to me, it's really interesting because we start with the fact that slavery is America's ghost. It's our national sin, our national horror. Yeah. And to me, what's brilliant about get out is that it takes this concept of the great American other and puts him in this white, apparently liberal world. And then you, again, you get that great horror flip that you see in all transcendent horror stories. And the horror flip here comes when our main character discovers that he's fallen into this modern day Southern plantation where black people are bought and sold as slaves. And it's just, you know, that, I, I, I mean, I still remember seeing the movie and that moment when I realized, what is really going on here? And it was just like, oh, you got to be kidding me. That is just, that is insanely great, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but, but yeah, that, that film. Um, and then, you know, at the end when he's struggling with the girlfriend and then this cop car pulls up and you yep. say, oh, okay. shit, this is what it's going <laughs> to be. It's going to be the same thing. And then you get that flip again there. Um, just such a great film. Um, but it, t it shows you what you can do with horror stories when you when it's more than just a slasher film, when it's more than just how many people can the guy kill in the period of 90 minutes to two hours. Yeah. yeah. And I think one of the, you know, we did an episode on Get Out not that long ago. Yeah. And we uh, kind of did some work trying to dive into the genre blends in that yeah. movie uh, with the comedy, especially, and then the sort of like satirical, you know, feeling to it, you know, which I know you've touched on. But um, can you say a little bit more maybe about the comedy blend in that movie or just about your your um, point earlier that the best examples of uh, successful movies in genre that we have today are blends of multiple kinds of genres. Yeah, it, it's blending genres is so important, and yet it's also an area that is so fraught with danger because mm. many writers, screenwriters, will know that, yeah, I, I, it's probably a mixed genre world. And, of course, it, this all started with the original Star Wars. But post-Star Wars, Every medium in story changed radically. It became a multi-genre world. And the, the problem is, even if you know that, you, if you don't know how to combine them properly, you run into story chaos. Because yeah. each genre has its own unique hero, already determined, predetermined main opponent, predetermined desire line, predetermined story beats, and so on. And so what happens is, when people combine these genres and they don't know what they're doing, they end up with all these heroes, all these opponents, way too many beats that don't sequence properly and way too many desire lines, which means they've got all these spines that don't hang together. So it's a big problem. And so one of the things that I talk about is that one of the ways that you can transcend the form is twist the beats or you mix genres that are not normally put together. So for example, a film like Inception, extremely popular. You break it down, you realize it's a science fiction heist movie. Now, we don't put those together, right? <laughs> so if you're the guy that put that together <laughs> the first time, you, you corner the market, <laughs> you know? And it's, it's just a, a brilliant strategy. Um, you know, I think, there are, at the same time, there are some combinations that are more likely than others. And, for example, we were talking about the crime form. One of the ways that you, there's two ways you transcend crime. Uh, one is that you write a, an epic crime tragedy. And examples of that would be, of course, the original crime and punishment, usual suspects, three billboards, dark night. But the other way you do it is that you combine it with black comedy. And, you know, first of all, transcendent crime stories of whatever kind you write are all about moral accounting over a lifetime. Meaning what you owe versus what you are owed in this life, but then it's given life and death stakes. You combine that with black comedy, which is a transcendent form of comedy. 
Black comedy is the comedy of destructive systems. So when you combine those two together, what you get is the playing out of karma on a massive scale through a terrible comedy of errors. And with black comedy, you put the audience in a superior position. And so what happens is the audience gets the pleasure of watching this, this horrible, this horrific, um, destructive system that is trapping the characters. They're trying to use crime to get free out of it, but instead it's a downward cycle. So they fall deeper and deeper into the trap. And so this is an example of if you know the genres, you know how to put certain genres together and mix them in a certain way and know how to make one of them the primary form and the other the secondary form, the, the, the potential that you get for your storytelling is massive. And in fact, if you look at the different chapters, most of the time, the way you transcend that form is you combine it with another form that is goes especially well with it. So for example, science fiction is best done at the transcendent level when it's combined with myth. Um, and or it's combined with horror. Um, mm -hmm. So these are knowing how these things combine is super important to be able to get the most out of your story. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, you know, reading those sections where you're talking about remixing things. It was, it was reminding me of I'm a, a nerd and I play D and D. And so in D and D you can multi-class <laughs> where you can be like, I'm going to be a rogue and I'm going to be a warrior. And uh, I love that you are free, that you're confident enough to admit <laughs> that. It's a yes. beautiful thing. No, absolutely. <laughs> D and D is all about storytelling. It's great. And so oh, it's great storytelling. My yeah. God. <laughs> um, but just in that combining of these two things, you yeah. get this totally new thing that like, you know, yeah. breathes new life into an experience. And so I think I was just getting so excited picturing all these. Yeah. Once you have like a handle on all these genres and can intelligently remix them, there's this exponential number of new kinds yes. of stories that can come. And you're even talking about, you know, uh, telling stories where, depending on the character's viewpoint you're currently in, like for one character, maybe this is a fantasy, but for another yes. character, it's a detective. Like all these really cool opportunities to remix something and yep. create something new out of it. It's just really exciting to think about. Yeah, I, I, that, that's part of what I, I talk about that in the future of, this, of storytelling in the final chapter, because to me, this mixing of genres is just going to get is just going to increase at an exponential rate and you will get a number of stories. And we've already moved in that direction where you literally could have all 14 major genres in that particular story. And of course, you know, it's 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 it's. Underneath the concept of transmedia, which, of course, has been this buzz phrase for many years now, but it's the idea that within one idea, you can have multiple genres that people can hook into the story f through different main characters and and it can have an experience and, and experience the story in different ways each time they see it. Uh, so I think that's just going to be, and and obviously we we get that in video games, but but I th I see it happening a great deal now, even in things like film and television, which are more the passive kind of storytelling that we've always had, because you you see things like like uh, you know stories that are as grandiose as uh, the Harry Potter stories or Game of Thrones. These are such massive serial structure stories that they allow you to blend in different genre forms in and out of the tapestry. And it just makes for a fantastic viewing experience. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I have a couple follow-up questions to that. But I guess my first one <laughs> is, is there a cautionary word, though, that you would give, or or perhaps not, that you would give to writers who are blending genres. Is there such a thing as too many? Or as you mentioned earlier, is there one way that you see writers often doing it incorrectly or in a way that you feel really doesn't work? Well, there is very possible to have too many genres. As I mentioned, if you don't know what you're doing, that's likely to be your problem. <laughs> um, now, 
it, it, let me give you some examples of when you can have too many genres. First of all, if those genres are not right for the story idea, genres mm. are embedded in the idea. It's not, you don't force the genre into the idea. You don't say, you know, it'd be great to, to, to get the female audience. Let's, let's put a love story in here. No, that's disaster. You don't <laughs> want to do that. It's got <laughs> to come out of that story idea that you have that, again, you're trying to make that unique. And this way, it's always driven me crazy when somebody describes their story as X meets Y. You know, if you can do it in that sort of a simple compartmentalized combination, it's not original. You know, you, you've got to go way beyond that. So it's, if it's not right for the idea, then you've got a problem. And the other thing is if you don't know how to mix them. And, mm -hmm. and this is, and, and that's why I was just touching on it in just a moment ago, which is that if you have three or four genres that you're mixing, it is absolutely essential that you choose one to be the primary form. Because that's yeah. going to give you your baseline. That gives you your structure. That gives you your spine. And then what you do is you bring in others, the, the genre elements from other forms where they work, but only if they complement and work with the main story beats of the primary genre. If you keep with, if you use that method of starting with the primary and then adding the secondary genres, you're probably going to be in pretty good shape. Um, but definitely don't force it in terms of say, oh, yeah, you know, John Truby said I got to have all these genres. No, <laughs> if the story idea is not there, you don't want to have it. Yeah. Yeah. The, you know, the same rule applies for multi-classing in D&D. &D. You know, you want to pick your main <laughs> role and then add on some, some supporting stuff to make I it. I am getting so much inside information here. <laughs> we're we're going to start a D&D &D game. We're going to do yeah. it. Um, yeah, well, and so that, I guess, leads me to, you know, I really appreciate what you just said and the book's emphasis on helping writers create stories that can be popular and marketable. Um, and the, the aspect, I think you mentioned it, um, up front, uh, that one of your goals for the book is writing, helping people write stories that sell, right. Right. Tell great stories that sell. Yeah. Um, I would love to hear a little bit more about how the marketability factor um, is in conversation with genre. So, you know, some genres are much more popular than others right now. Um, and what would you tell writers who are looking for the genre that's right for them to start writing in? Well, the first thing I would tell writers is don't ever write genres because you think they're the hot genre. Don't ever do it. You cannot predict the market. You will have huge problems if you do. So what I always tell writers is, first rule is, write the genre you love best. The genre that expresses your life philosophy, because then you're tapping into, again, you're tapping into that deeper theme. And the, the second rule in terms of what genre you write is, write one that you write best. Um, because these genres are very complex story systems. And I've been doing this for a lot of years, and I don't know anyone who has mastered more than two or three genres. So mm. I believe that it's essential in terms of your success in the marketplace to specialize and become the very best in your forms. And that's going to take some practice. It takes time. And it's important to remember that you're not competing against everybody writing all the genres. You're not competing against all screenwriters. No, you're competing yeah. against everyone writing in your genre. And so, you know, to go back to the, the main theme of the book is your best chance to sell your story is when you transcend the genre. And yes, you have to hit the beats. You have to sequence them in a, dr in a dramatic sequence. But the real key to standing out from everybody else is do you transcend the genre? Do you express the deeper life philosophy? Do you express a theme that has real power to the audience under the surface? And that way, you've not only nailed the genre, you've done it in a way no one else has ever done it before. 
And then the business has to come to you because they can't get it from anyone else. This is what I've always told writers in terms of, you know, don't write a copy of a movie you saw six months ago with a little twist to it. They can get that from anybody. They don't have to pay you for that. What they have to pay you for and what they have to potentially pay big money for is something they can't get from anyone else. And that means you've got to pay your dues by hitting one or more genres, but you've also got to do them in a way that is so unique that it's a work of art. And then, again, you're on the path to creating a story brand that sets you apart from almost all of the writers working in the world today. And that's that's what we're talking about. We're talking about a worldwide market now. It's tough enough to be competing in the U.S. market. It's, we're way past that. So this, this aspect, this idea of transcending the genre, I cannot put more emphasis on that as the, as the key to eventual success. Mm. Yeah. You, so you, you talk about, like you're saying, the hero strategies to help you write and sell screenplays, but there's also this kind of deeper side to the book, which I really appreciated. And at one point you write, you know, stories define life. Understanding the anatomy of a story is about much more than writing. It's also about knowing how to live. And so I'm curious to hear just your, your thoughts on the role that story plays in, in our everyday lives. That was one, you know, one of my favorite sections of the book is just talking about how, you know, kind of everything is story and the way that we see the world is yeah. story. I'm a big, you all know, a Harari fan. And in his book, Sapiens, he talks about like, that's one of the yeah. primary things that sets humans apart is that we can create yep. stories. So I'd, yeah, I'd love to hear you just kind of talk about uh, that aspect of all I of this. I agree about the Harari fan. <laughs> uh, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. And, and it's why I started the book that way. Um, and it's also where I could then go into it in detail in the detective story when I talk about transcending the detective form. Transcending the detective form is a story about the mind and truth. It's about how the mind itself works. But I start the book by with the chapter heading of uh, the world as story. And, you know, we always think of human beings as, as a storytelling animal. Well, it's a lot more than that. We don't just tell stories. We are stories, beginning with the very first story, which is me. You know, it, and, and as you develop from the, 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 the youngest baby all the way through the rest of your life, you're doing it through the lens of your story. You are the hero. Everybody else is some kind of other character in that story. And that means that you are interpreting everything through a story model. And so what I was trying to do in this book, besides just giving writers the techniques for writing a great genre story of whatever their form is, is to allow them to see that these genres are portals into how the world works. And first of all, and second of all, how to live successfully in that world. And I believe that if you understand story and understand types of story, your ability to have a rich life just goes up tremendously because each of these genres has deep wisdom, deep wisdom to express. And they've learned to express that over hundreds and sometimes thousands of years. So that's why I say both in the introduction and in the, the, the final chapter on the future of storytelling, this idea of seeing the world through the story lens as the most fundamental way to understand the world is, I think that realization is going to grow exponentially um, as, we go, as, as we go through life and that the, the future, which is that stories are the religion of the universal religion of the world, that's already happening. That's already been happening. And yeah. to me, that's a very positive sign because these are not, this is not a religion that divides people. This is a religion that unifies people, shows how we're all human. We're all trying to get through the world. We're all trying to have the best life we can have. And understanding story is an incredibly important way to having the best life you can have. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I love all that. I think it's beautiful. I think it's a great thing 
to pair with you know practical lessons, but also look at yeah. the why behind it and why this is meaningful and an important part of life and a thing that's worth doing. Uh, so I was really happy to see all of that in there. Yeah. And, you know, we always say that on Beyond the Screenplay, one of our goals is to like make ourselves and hopefully our listeners more thoughtful moviegoers mm -hmm. and more thoughtful consumers of story. Um, I think a lot of us tend to respond emotionally <laughs> just on yeah. a gut level to like, I like this or I don't like that in a movie or, or whatever it is. And especially now when, um, people respond to film in like a very brief tweet or, yeah. you know, people, <laughs> they give five stars or, right. or two stars or whatever it is. Um, coming at a story with the nuance of understanding the genre, the history of the genre, yeah. the inherent thematic questions, I think is so crucial. And that's, I think, one thing that even being a part of our show and getting to, you know, dive more into the theory of storytelling has really changed me in the way that I watch movies and talk about them for sure. Well, that, that's that's one of the reasons why I think your your podcasts and, and, and Michael, your videos uh, have been so successful is because to me, giving people the tools to understand why a story is working or not working mm -hmm. is really important. And it's something people are craving. They want to have that desperately because they want to see, you know, stories, we're experiencing them all the time. They're a major part of what makes life worth living. And, you know, people, people for years, people have said to me, well, you know, breaking stories down in all these ways, doesn't it mean that you don't really, don't really like story, movies much anymore? And I, and I say, no, it's just, just the opposite. You know, it's, it, when I see how, what great storytelling is happening and why it's happening, it makes my appreciation for what that artist has done so much more. And it just makes me love the art, the craft of story. And, you know, that's why I've spent my whole life on it. Um, it's just to me, it's that important and it's that valuable to my life. And I think it's that valuable to everybody else's life. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we agree. <laughs> nodding and smiling over here. Yeah, completely agree. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's so I love this book. I can't wait for people to read it and check it out. I loved the anatomy of story. I feel like they're, as you're saying, giving people these tools to understand what they love, live better lives, all these things. It's a, you can tell a lot of work has gone into this and uh, it's like just a very nice gift that you've given us in writing this. Thank so I'm you. really excited for people to check it out. Um, before we let you go, I'm going to put you on the spot here. So we do a thing uh, sometimes called uh, What Are You Watching? where we recommend something that we've seen recently, either a movie or a show or something like that. Is there something, John, that you've been watching recently that you would recommend to our listeners? Oh, you, you caught me at a bad time. You caught me at a bad time. You know, with COVID, I basically ended up watching everything that's ever been made, every story that's ever been told, because sure. I had nothing else that I could do, right? And, and one of the things that, that was most interesting to me, because I've for many years have been saying that that you know, we, we, we have lived, we've been fortunate to live through two revolutions in story in our lifetime. The first is the, the, the revolution of television becoming an art form. And it's happening only in the last 20 years. And in my opinion, it has, and it's done it through serial story structure, which is basically novel, t novel writing in television. And it, to me, it's done it to such a degree that it has long surpassed film as the greatest storytelling medium in the world. Um, and it's why I use extensive examples from television in the book, like Mad Men, like Breaking Bad, uh, which I think are, are two of the greatest works of art of the last <laughs> hundred years. I mean, I, 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 know, I know it sounds like I'm over gushing about this, but no, <laughs> it's not. They are that good. But so that's one of the revolutions. The other revolution is the rise of the female myth. And I talk about this in the myth chapter. Um, this is a hugely important thing because for the last 3,000 years, female myth was wiped out from Western culture. 
and it, we had the male warrior myth, and then and people like Joseph Campbell came along and said, oh, well, this is the mono myth. No, it is not a mono myth. It is the male warrior myth. You know, that's not the only way to tell a myth story, much less to tell a story in general. So what's happened just in the last 10 years is the female myth is coming back, and it is coming back huge. I consider it to be one of the major forms of the next few decades and beyond. I don't see it diminishing. I see it because it gives us a whole different way of solving life problems and solving world problems than the male warrior approach, which is clearly not going to work anymore. We can't afford <laughs> to kill each other off in the world. But I know that's not answering your question, but it does answer it in a certain way, which is, Yes, TV has far surpassed film in the last 20 years, but with streaming, television has become so popular and they're putting so much into production that we are now seeing the decline of the golden age of television. And I think in some of the, the Emmy choices that I've seen in just the last two or three years, um, in, in terms of both drama and comedy, um, y yes, there's still great stuff being made on television, but but you're not getting the just huge number of not just good shows, great shows, great storytelling week after week, you know, at a pace that you can't even imagine. How can they write that well every <laughs> week? You know, it just used to blow my mind. That's not happening anymore. That said, um, the the gangster show Peaky Blinders has been to me an absolute revelation. I love that show. I know it. they, they, they had their last season, I think, about a year ago. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, the, the excellence on that level is just phenomenal. Um, another writer, writer-director that I just am a huge fan of is Martin McDonough. Um, you know, he, he of the In Bruges and uh, and if, what is it, Ebbing, Missouri, the, whatever that long bullets. title is. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, to me that, you know, I do, a, a, as you know, a deep breakdown of In Bruges in the crime chapter. I mean, this guy is writing at a whole level, uh, uh, another level that that I don't know anybody who is writing that kind of greatness um, in the film, in the film area, um, you know, for for television, a guy like Vince Gilligan, Breaking Bad, and then, you know, the uh, Better Call Saul. I mean, the, again, just the excellence there is just phenomenal. Uh, there's probably others that I'm not thinking <laughs> of right now, but that's because I'm thinking of the shows that have disappointed me that I'm thinking, mm. you know, we're just... Yeah. We're making too many of these now. I, you know, I, I never would have heard me say that in the past, but I'm saying it now. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, I, I definitely have felt that also. And it, it almost in some ways just made me appreciate how great we had it for so long, yes. like you were saying. Yeah. And, and that there's, of course, still great stuff happening. But yeah, I, I really enjoyed your kind of mini takedown of Joseph Campbell and the monomyth. <laughs> that was, was kind of cathartic. <laughs> well, it made me think that you must be really excited for way of water to come out because you spend oh, a lot yeah. of time in the myth chapter talking about avatar and the female myth so uh, and we're about to do a podcast on avatar here actually oh, tomorrow great. we're going to record it yeah. so that's great oh, i'm, I'm excited, excited to get into that too <laughs> revolutionary film and it, it it was the beginning of the female myth because in that hmm. in one film you have a film a story that goes from male myth to female myth at the mm -hmm. same time it goes from a you know a tech culture to a, a, a native culture to me, in spite of some obvious, ridiculous <laughs> things that happen in the story, um, it, it is the, the things that it's that it's at a, again a whole level, another level of brilliance is, and and its influence is just massive. massive. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. That's gonna be a fun conversation. <laughs> John, where can people find the book? Uh, you go to this site anatomyofgenres.com. That's all one word, anatomy of genres. Um, and there are a number of different stores where you can get the book, whatever you, wherever you like to buy your books, um, go there. And uh, uh, I'm hoping that you will find this 
book to be as helpful to you as it was fun for me to write, even though it almost <laughs> killed me. Um, <laughs> I, I, I hope that you, you get a, a great deal out of it and that it really helps your storytelling. Mm. Yeah, I certainly did. I think anyone that listens to this podcast will appreciate it. Highly yep. recommend going out and Yeah, strong recommend it. for me too. It was an incredibly interesting read. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Awesome. Uh, okay, well, so we want to say a quick thank you to our patrons that make this show possible. Thank you to our producer, Vince Major, our editors, Caleb Berg, Graham Harther, and Eric Schneider. I'm Michael Tucker. I've been joined today by Trish Rand and John Truby. His latest book, The Anatomy of Genres, How Story Forms Explain the Way the World Works, is available now. John, thank you so much for joining us. This has been awesome. Thank you all. It's been a t- complete joy. And and anytime you want to talk story, I'm happy to do that with you because you guys are great. <laughs> well, thank gonna, you so much, John. We're going to remember that. Yeah. Yeah, we will. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> awesome. All right. Thanks, everyone, for listening. And we will see you in the next episode. Bye, everyone. <laughs>